I'm nine years old, and we don't eat meat, my mom and me, because we're vegetarians. But since my stepfather Leopoldo entered our world, we have meat in the house, steaks in the refrigerator. We buy them every week now, whether my mom needs them or not. I now know how meat feels, but not how it tastes. Cold, thick, rubbery, subtly etched like the spirals of my fingerprints. Its raw face comes pressed against the shrink wrap, pinning it down into the curling yellow styrofoam. It's funny how raw meat heals raw meat. The cold steak reduces the swelling on my mom's cheekbone, tenderized from a night soaked in alcohol. Cold steak on the puppy protrusion that threatens to swallow her right eye, blackened for looking at other men. Cold steak on her lips, cracked for talking back. Her face is a disaster, but the cool, moist flesh draws down the pain, the discoloration, the swelling. It's funny how this dead flesh gives life yet. And I want to be like that piece of dead flesh, cool and collected. I want to suck at her wounds to draw out the poison of her injuries. I want to lay hands on her and take all her pain and suffering into myself, leaving her whole and refreshed. I want to enliven this face this face ravaged by another angrier face, a Leopoldo face, now sitting silently across the room, open with remorse. Even when he's sorry, Leopoldo scares me. His body is always tightly coiled, ready to strike out. He's sinewy and strong. Scars fleck his moody surface, here from a knife, there from broken glass. One of his impossibly rounded biceps has a jagged, dark bullet scar, and he carries a bullet fragment in his lower back. He still feels it whenever he crouches or jumps. At night, my mom holds me tight and sways with me back and forth until I feel that I will carry that embrace with me forever. She takes her glasses off to nuzzle my neck with her nose. Her face is clear and bright, framed by a halo of dark curls. She tucks me tight and kisses me on the forehead, rises and turns off the light, I call out into the darkness, I love you, Mom, and she says, I love you too, and then she closes the door, and I'm alone, and she's not alone, there's a man out there waiting for her, this man nourishing his demons with green bottles of malt liquor, he yells at her, accuses her, threatens her, and then, as often as not, he begins hitting her, really beating on her, she screams in her defense, or pleads with him to stop, or promises to do or not do, whatever it is. And dishes break and things are thrown and knocked over. Impacts to walls and floors make booms and crashing sounds. And his palms and his fists and his feet make slapping and thudding sounds against her body. And I'm casting about my room in a panic, grabbing at one thing and then another. Searching for some object, some strategy that I can use. Clutching first a book and then a trophy and then a toy bat. What the hell can I do? I'm just a little kid, right? Well, I'm 9 and 10 and 11 and then 12. Is that so little? I'm crying. Will this be the time that he kills her? Or is this the night that I will go out and protect my mother? What would a man do? I'm her son, her only son. I pretend to ask myself, why don't I ever remember to hide a kitchen knife in here? But I know that I'm completely and totally impotent. I'm leaving my mom to die. I always do the same thing. I calm down. It's important to calm down. I climb back into bed and hunker down beneath blankets and pillows. I muffle the sounds of my mother's destruction. I used to cry myself to sleep, but now the sounds are too routine to bring tears. I suppress the churning in my belly and the lump in my throat. And as mom taught me, I project my spirits beyond the stained walls into the swirling mists outside where the nature spirits are waiting for me. My soul will skim the surface of the earth and hover in happier places around happier scenes. And like that, I trick myself into sleeping. He doesn't hit me, but he bosses me around, mocks me, threatens me. I'm 12 years old when I think I finally have it in me to kill him. Get out, I say. You're nothing without us, you're nothing! He doesn't even look upset. My time has come. He just casually punches me in the mouth, and I fly backwards, crashing into the couch. 
But I bounce right back up, my upper lip, bloody and numb. I'm screaming at him, get out, get out! And magically, he does get out. He storms out. And in that moment, my mother shatters her way back into reality, back into sanity. It was somehow okay for him to beat the shit out of her, but not me, not her boy. So we pack fast, and we run. That summer, we hide out in John and Susan Oliver's basement. I see John peer out protectively whenever we hear cars coming up the driveway. But it's all for show. John's woefully scrawny. Leopoldo could snap his neck like that. But Leopoldo doesn't find us that summer. And then we move up farther north to the woods in Skagit County. I'm 13 years old and I'm strong. And now I hope he does find us. I wait for the day. I eventually pray for the day that he finds us. I've got a semi-automatic M14 rifle with a 10-round clip. And I've got knives everywhere in my bed, in my boot, in my backpack, my book bag. I'm Rambo! <laughs> and I'm ready to fuck him up. I fantasize about it. But he never does find us. He never finds me waiting for him. I'm 27 years old. I'm an attorney with a new client in a maximum security prison for women. We're going down the list of questions, and I asked her what her batterer would typically do when he was done whipping her. And she tells me that he would gently tend to her wounds with witch hazel, doctoring the red welts on her brown skin. He kept steaks in the fridge to heal her. The meat brought down the swelling. I stop writing, and we both look into the distance past the bars on the window, and she says, isn't it funny how raw meat heals raw meat? And I agree that it is funny. And after a pause, she starts thanking me again for taking her case. I was a stranger to you, she says. You didn't even know me, and yet here you are. Here I am, I say. I feel like I've known you for a long time. After a silence, she says, All I ever wanted was for him to leave me alone. That's all I wanted. But he came after us. He found us. You have to believe me, I didn't want him dead. I didn't want him dead. I believe her. I believe that unlike me, this convicted killer never wanted her batterer dead. And there, in the prison, I'm finally thankful that he never did find me, waiting for him. I'm not the